Okay. Let's get started. We uh, have quite a bit to do today. So, let's kick off. We, we stopped here last week, or at the start of the week. Um, we stopped here, and we were talking about feedback systems. The, what I wanted you to learn, essentially, from, la, from the last lecture, was that data is very, very poor in macroeconomics. The data that you have is extremely poor. And what that means is that the testable predictions that you can derive from that data are very poor as well. It means, fundamentally, you have to be humble about the quality of your knowledge. You can't go on the radio and say, the economy will recover tomorrow. Okay? There's lots of people who did that, and they turned out to be absolutely dead wrong. That's the first point from the last lecture. The second point is that there is such a thing as a dynamic equilibrium. The way to understand the dynamic equilibrium is to simply imagine a bathtub. If you imagine a bathtub, imagine water flowing into it and flowing out of it. When the rate of inflow is equal to the rate of the outflow, that is a dynamic equilibrium. You have previously seen what are so-called static equilibria. The idea that at a certain point supply and demand meet uh, where the ASAD model uh, finds its equilibrium, and so on and so forth. Okay? Then we moved on to talk about feedback in wages and feedback systems. The idea of a feedback is that it's a loop that affects a stock. A feedback is a loop that affects a stock. Okay? And the reason, the reason I'm very interested in feedbacks is because feedbacks are what generate economic activity. You've all been subject to feedbacks. In fact, most of you are here because you're very good at responding to feedbacks. Most of you are here because you're very good at doing exams. In fact, you're extremely good at doing exams. Because not only did you get through your junior cert and your leaving cert, you got through to college as well. I know many of you are thinking, of course we did. But the only reason you feel like that's mediocre is because everybody you know also went to college. In fact, there's a huge dropout rate even at the leaving cert level. So that's the first thing. You get feedback from your marks. It says, you're really clever. John is very clever. Jane is very clever. Or John is not very clever at maths. Or Jane is very clever at English, or something like that. That's a feedback. And it changes your behavior. Your feedback changes your behavior. Maybe you decide, oh, I need to work harder at maths. Or maybe you decide, if maths was my bed, I would sleep on the floor. It's up to you. So feedback is important. You have the opportunity to give me feedback starting next week. There is, I, I, I ask for feedback in lectures every, 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 uh, every day, but a part of my job is to seek feedback from you. So you'll be getting an email at the start of next week to give student evaluations of your lecture and of this course. This is your opportunity to tell me what you think about the course. Okay? It's not your opportunity to slag me just for the crack. Although, I'm a pretty, I have a pretty thick skin, I can take it. But if you have constructive uh, criticism, if you uh, want to tell me that I'm awesome, that's nice too. But if you don't, that's fine. It's an anonymous survey, it's important that you take it, okay? I'm not going to change my behavior unless you give me feedback. I've asked for this feedback at the very earliest point in the semester so that I can act on it for you, okay? It's, it's coming out in week five. I'll get the results at the end of week five or the start of week six, and I'll change the course if that's what you want. If you don't, uh, give me the feedback. I can't change things, okay? That's not an argument for, for it to say, he's the worst lecturer ever, you know, should jump off a cliff. <laughs> if you have positive things to say, say them, okay? But, uh, because that would really help. But if you, if you don't, say those two. All right, so feedback is important and I encourage you to give me feedback. I'll be putting it up on the blog as well uh, and the TAs will remind you. But, so pretty please with sugar on top, fill out that form. Now, feedbacks in wages. There's a very important effect, a very important effect. The more, the more prices go up, the more wages have to go up. The more wages have to go up uh, if people are to maintain their standard of living. No, that's way better, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. I'll just I'll I'll, I'll plug in the. I'm, I'm going to show you a video in a minute. I'll plug it in later because I just heard that weird background noise. 
uh, of which I suppose I'm a part. Okay, uh, the more prices go up, the more wages have to go up, and people are to maintain their standard of living. Uh, uh, many of the mature students here uh, will remember the punt. Um, they will remember when the value of, a, of, of 20 pounds was roughly equivalent to 50 euros right now. Um, uh, when you, you'll hear your, your, your grandmother saying something to the effect of, when, when I was a girl, you know, Hayfence Thruppany would have bought you, a, you know, you would have gone to the cinema, bought a small car, three slaves, and a packet of crisps, and it would have been fine. Um, and, and, and that doesn't happen anymore because the real purchasing power of money has been eroded. So what you see is that as prices go up, wages have to go up to keep pace if living standards are, are to maintain uh, uh, their, their level. The more wages go up, the more prices have to go up. So it's a feedback mechanism. One is directly affected by the other. I showed you this data at the, very, at the, at the end of last, uh, the last lecture. What you're looking at here is, is just to the end of 2010, the changes in wages and prices, okay? 2010 to 2011. Over a 30 year period, you can see, first off, that there's a massive amount of variation in the 70s uh, in terms of the change in labor costs because wages were fluctuating very, very rapidly. And then things calm down here as social partnership kind of takes off. This is where the unions and management and the government get, basically get into bed with one another and say, we're going to accept this level of, of collective bargaining. And then the, uh, the crisis hits uh, here. And you see the following relation. Um, this is coming down and then jumping back up. So wages are, are changing over time with a very seasonal effect. But here prices change first, as measured by the consumer price index. So if prices go down, wages will go down. Very interesting. This brings us to a fundamental relationship in economics, something called Phillips curve. Would everybody draw that diagram, please? What this diagram relates is the change in inflation relative to the change in unemployment. It is a mechanical feedback mechanism that was discovered, if you like, in the 1950s by a guy called ACW Phillips. And so what Phillips said was, uh, there is a relationship between the change in unemployment and the change in inflation. If the government wants to lower employment by spending, it must deal with higher rates of inflation. This is very important. This relationship is true at, uh, well, when you, when you correct for expectations, this turns out to be true for uh, large developed economies. Okay? The feedback comes, and put everybody please write down the feedback as well. The feedback comes from government spending. That, incre that, that decreases unemployment. That gives people money to spend. They go off and spend, and, and that causes inflation. How does spending cause inflation? If, if you're selling iPods or iPads or something, and uh, you're selling iPads, and um, somebody comes along and says, I want 12 iPads because their, their wages have just gone up, you are incentivized to increase the price. If everybody increases the price at the same time, that is what inflation is. Okay? So what you end up doing is, is, is causing this change. So let's say you are at a fairly high level of inflation. For a high level of inflation, get a low level of unemployment. And similarly, if you, if you are here and you want to reduce unemployment, okay, if you want to run back up this curve, you have to suck it up and deal with a higher level of inflation. That is what the Phillips curve represents. It represents a relationship, a negative relationship between unemployment and inflation. Okay? It is, in a sense, a policy trade-off. So, give everybody a minute to take that down. Phillips was a really, really interesting guy. Um, he was actually an engineer. He, he started life out as an engineer. And um, what he did was he understood feedback control mechanisms. You all have feedback control mechanisms in your houses. They're called thermostats. What happens is, what happens with a thermostat is it, it, it basically is a piece of metal. And, the, and, and as the piece of metal heats up, it touches a contact. And as it cools down, it moves away from the contact. Yeah? And so what you see is this really interesting relationship between heat and the switch and cold and the switch. Okay? And so what Phillips did, what Phillips did, what Phillips did, his big idea effectively, was to draw on his background as an engineer and apply this feedback control mechanism to the economy. The idea of this feedback 
that you could, in some sense, understand what's going on. His idea was the government can control the economy. We can maintain and control an unstable multiplier process using policy. Um, that means we can influence the path of policy over time. Okay. He showed us unemployment, low unemployment is associated with high inflation, uh, presumably because tight labor markets stimulated wage inflation. The idea here is quite simple. We, if, you, if you have no, nobody that, 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 that needs a job, they're all spending. If they're all spending, that means there's going to be inflationary pressures. Okay? Now, it turns out that Philip's original findings weren't correct. He was incorrect. He, his, his findings were correct, sorry, for, for the UK economy, for the post-war UK economy. They weren't true for all developed economies uh, throughout time. And so Robert Solow and, and, and uh, Paul Samuelson, two future Nobel laureates in economics, um, replicated these findings for the US and they trashed them. They showed that uh, lower unemployment could be achieved only at the cost of higher inflation, but also uh, with, with a, uh, an expectations component. People think about future inflation. Okay? And they were really kicked around the place in the 1970s by two guys who would also later uh, win the Nobel Prize, Milton Friedman and Ned Phelps. And what uh, Milton and Ned said were, basically, inflation today has to be related to the way you think about the future. I'm not going to buy a big screen TV. I would actually really love, personally, I would love to buy a big screen TV, but I'm not going to. And the reason I'm not going to, I have like a little tiny 19-inch TV in my house, and it's really annoying. Um, it's good because the kids can't wreck it, because it's just too small for them. But I'd like a bigger TV. And I'm not going to buy one. And the reason I'm not going to buy one is because I know the budget is coming and my wages are going to get cut to pieces. I'm also pretty worried about the Croke Park agreement. If that, if that gets cut to pieces, my wages are toast. So there's no way I'm going to eat into my savings to buy a big screen TV. Okay? So, so my expectation about the future, which is that my income will surely drop. Absolutely, it will surely drop. Um, my expectation about that means that I'm, I'm, that's going to affect my purchases today. And we already talked about that. And so the expectation augmented Phillips curve looks like this. Inflation today is inflation yesterday minus the expected change of, of unemployment times a particular speed of adjustment. Okay? So that's the, that's the Phillips curve. Now what I've done is I've, I've replicated it for Ireland for you. So here is the Phillips curve for Ireland. Okay? So here's the change in inflation here. And here's the change in unemployment. This, this line here represents what it would look like if it were a straight line. It's actually the line of best fit. Now you can see two things from this graph. The first is, this is not a linear relationship. Okay? It's basically completely random. <laughs> yeah? That's the first thing. It's basically completely random. So Philip's relationship doesn't really hold for Ireland. The second thing is that this model, this linear model, is a very poor explanator of the, of the variation of the data. That, that thing there up there is called R squared. What R squared measures is the amount of variation in the data that is explained by the model. Okay? It measures the amount of data, uh, the amount of variation in the data that is explained by the model. And what, that, what this is telling you is that only 3% of the variation is actually explained by the model. In other words, Steve, your model is crap. Very crap. In fact, it's 97% crap. So that's not good. That's not good. So the empirical Phillips curve, the basic one that I've shown you, isn't correct for Ireland because I haven't included expectations. Okay? Here, just to give you a sense of how things have changed, what a regime change we're in, those red lines, basically what we're looking at here is this, this is moving this way. This is... This is uh, the start of the series. So this is, I think, 1950. And it moves like this. You know? And this, here, is 2007. Okay? So you can see, you can see that 2007 was a pretty weird, you know, it was a pretty weird couple of years. Quite a strange uh, time, as a matter of fact. But what's important here is that there's a feedback. There's a feedback going on here. So if there's massive unemployment, and there's a 14.8% unemployment rate here, folks, that's 309,000 people. The unemployment statistics are horrendous in this country. What that means is that there should be no inflationary pressure. And in fact, there isn't. 
except the inflation rate is going up. Why is the inflation rate going up? The text message thing should work. So if you want to text me, text me. Why is the inflation rate going up? It's actually 2% or something. Why is it going up? Text away if you want. It's fine. Uh, also, I'll take some questions on the book review. I know I was talking to some people in the, uh, in the canteen earlier on today, so I'll, I'll answer those in a minute. Um, wh why is that? Why is that the case? Well, let me show you. Um, basically, I'll show you why it's the case. Here is the consumer price index. This is the very latest data. It was released a couple of days ago, I think. What you see here is the 13th of September, uh, a couple of months, ago, a couple of weeks ago now. Okay, so prices have risen by two percent. There's two measures. The first is the CPI. This is the consumer price index. The second is the uh, harmonized index of consumer prices. This thing here. And you can see two things. The first is all items, annual percentage change, it's going up. It's going up. Okay. So why, did it, why is it going up? Why is it going up? Well, the most notable changes were increases in education. The price of education has gone up. Do any of you know, have any of you noticed that the price of education has gone up? Your registration fees have gone up. Yeah, so the price, of price has gone up. Uh, miscellaneous goods and services, transport. So why would the price of transport go up? Petrol, very good. So petrol, petrol prices. Does Ireland have any control over petrol prices? No. Why? Because we don't have any oil fields um, yet. So uh, miscellaneous goods and services and alcoholic beverages and tobacco. So this is an interesting feature of all recessions. An interesting feature of all recessions is that in a recession, people drink more. And people also eat more basic staple goods. So the demand for sliced pan goes up. The demand for ciabatta goes down. People start uh, rationalizing a little bit more. Okay, so that's one kind of reason why uh, that this has happened. And uh, the Central Statistics Office is a really, really useful thing for you to be looking at. Anyway, so what what contributed to the monthly change? Clothing and footwear went down. Transport costs increased, and housing, water, and electricity uh, decreased because of lower interest rates. Uh, because of lower interest rates. Are you the guy from the UPC ad? <laughs> Great guy would be eliminated. No, I'm not. Is it, was it, is it Craig Doyle? <laughs> Please let me Craig Doyle from those ads. I think it is. Anyway, <laughs> I actually met him. It's a bit, it's, it's, it, okay, okay. And all I could think of was, you will be eliminated. You will be eliminated. So that's not good. It's not a good way to think. So here's European unemployment. It's not looking too good. It's not looking too good. So inflation and unemployment. Here's here's the European level. By the way, if you're if you're between 16 and 24 in Spain, the unemployment rate is 51 percent. 51 percent. The unemployment rate in the Midwest is 28 percent if you're between 16 and 24. So it's so it's half. Uh, uh, Half what we're seeing. What's interesting here, what's interesting here is this is the unemployment rate, and it's it's pretty pretty horrendous actually. Okay, there are several types of loop. Would you write these three down, please? Balancing, reinforcing, and complete competing. There are three types of loop. Three types of loop: balancing and reinforcing, uh, and competing. Okay. So a balancing loop does exactly that. It balances the system out. A good example of a balancing loop is the circular flow model. It's a balancing loop. So my consumption is your expenditure. Your expenditure is my income. That's a balancing loop. Okay? And a, a change in one changes the other almost immediately. A balancing loop. A good example, circular flow. A reinforcing loop. A reinforcing loop. So one way to think of a reinforcing loop is it's either an explosion or an implosion. Yeah. So if, if something, you can imagine the property market, okay? The property market, if, if everybody's selling houses and the prices are going up, then you see that everybody's selling houses and the prices are going up, so you should sell your house. 
And if you sell your house and the price goes up, then happy days and you can borrow more money. That's a reinforcing loop, yeah? That's reinforcing. So it explodes. It's an explosive process. It's called the multiplier accelerator process, as a matter of fact. It's very, very dangerous. It's highly unstable, actually. Um, similarly, there's a damping process. A damping process is how you think about the future. The discount rate damps the way you think about the future. If you, for example, um, if I can give you 100 euros now or 100 euros in five years, how, how much money do you need in interest to, to, to just exactly balance that? So you're completely indifferent between 100 euros now and 100 euros in five years. You probably need, on average, between 10 euros and 30 euros, on average, yeah? On average. That, the idea there is, is that you're, you've discounted the future payment of 100 euros back, so you need about 130 to make it equal. Um, similarly, if I move it at another 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, the value goes up. In other words, you damp the values of the future back into the present. It's a damping loop. Okay? And so what it does is it reinforces the present-oriented nature of your consumption and your investment decisions. And there are competing loops. There are loops that work against one another. A great example of this is the predator-prey model. So, so uh, there are foxes and there are rabbits. The rabbits eat the grass. The foxes eat the rabbits. If the foxes eat all the rabbits, the foxes will starve. Yeah, they compete against one another, but if the foxes eat too many of them, there's, then the, the fox population grows and they, the foxes all starve. If, the, if there aren't enough foxes, the rabbits eat all the grass and then the rabbits starve. Okay? So they're predator-prey models. They need to compete with one another and through their competition, they balance one another. So the way to think about that is to think about the populations of foxes and rabbits, or any kind of predator-prey system you'd like to think about. So, uh, balancing, reinforcing, and competing and, and, uh, competing, and competing and balancing. Now, I told you that Phillips was an engineer. I told you that Phillips was an engineer. And uh, not, only, not only did Phillips come up with a new model for the economy, he literally built it. This is the Moniac. It's a fully built hydraulic Keynesian model. He's got water flowing around the system in a circular flow. I hope your comment is worth it. Everyone will want to invest because money 
water pumping around the system. That's the Moniac. Moniac was uh, a fairly brilliant idea, actually. It was designed not as a teaching tool at all. Moniac was designed to make predictions about the economy. But I think you, you saw three things in that. The first is that you can build a hydraulic model of the economy. That, that is a model, in the same way as the mathematical <coughs> models that you study on, in pencil and paper. It's just far cooler. I think that's really cool. OK, I'm a bit of a propeller, but I think that's awesome. And the fact that the guy is able to build his own little model is just brilliant. Um, and uh, I like his accent as well. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyway, um, the important thing here, the other important thing was, was that you must, in order to make something like this work, you must clearly understand the difference between stocks and flows. If you understand the difference between stocks and flows, you will honestly do so much better in economics and probably, you know, life in general. So, what I would like you to do, for me now please, is draw the relationship between the volume of water in the bathtub through time when the plug is pulled. Assume, assume the bath is like three quarters full of water, okay? Assume the bath is three quarters full of water. Here's my bath. Here's my bath. Here's my tap. And at the start, at time t equals zero, the bath is three quarters full. Okay, and then assume uh, at, at some particular time, t plus k, whatever, an hour afterwards, uh, uh, the, the, the plug is pulled and outflows the water at some rate. Okay, so this is the volume of water as measured by the amount of it in the, in, in the tub and time. What's it going to look like? The plug is pulled, the tap is off. Take out your pens and paper, draw what's going to happen. Draw what happens to the relationship between the volume of water in the bath and time. Okay? I will walk around and shout slogans in your ears. That's Max the envelope, etc. Feel the burn. It's
So what's going to happen is, what's going to happen is that it's going to decrease more or less linearly. So you might have a, a bit of a pull at the start where there's a bit, there's a bit, of, there's a bit of motion that sets off the, the, the plug. And then after that a vortex forms. And once the vortex forms, the rate of uh, 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 descent from the plug, assuming that, there's no, um, assuming that there's no blockages, is going to be more or less uh, linear. So it's going to look a little bit like that. So like a curve and a straight line. So it's like that. So this is the bit where it's just starting, when the, when the plug is actually full of air, not water, and the rest of it is just a straight decline. Okay? What determines the slope of this line? What determines the slope of the line, which is the speed of the descent? Clearly it's not the molecular properties of the water, right? The amount of water, well, that, that, that wouldn't determine the slope of the line. I mean the plug hole, exactly. If you had a plug hole like this size, it'd take a couple of seconds. Yeah? And if you had plug some tiny little, you know, pin sized plug hole, it might take a long time. So now, many of you had cups of tea and cups of coffee today. I would like you to consider I would like you to consider two things. The first is the first thing here is there are two equilibria in this system. The first equilibria is here. Okay? That's the first equilibrium where there's no water. It's infinitely boring. And this, this, is the, this is another equilibrium where there is just a full tank and there's no change in the stock. Yeah? So you can see that at, at, at each point in time, here it's time zero. Okay? There's a full tank, you're three quarters full. You're here. Okay? So there's a stock. And here there's another stock. And the stock is equal to zero, right? This is time one. Okay, t equals one, and there's a stock, but the, but the problem is the bathtub is absolutely empty, so it's basically zero. Okay, so there were two. There's a change from this bathtub to this bathtub, from three quarters full to zero percent full, uh, and these are two equilibria. They're two stocks. The flow is what happens over time. This is the flow. Okay, and again, if this seems boring, just change the change the example. Just change the example. Think about your own personal bank account. Okay. However, most of the time we don't reduce to zero, okay? Consider a coffee cup. Consider a coffee cup. What normally happens with, a co with coffee is that, unless you're strange, you like hot coffee. I don't understand why people like cold coffee, but I understand some people like it. You freaks. Um, strange, odd people with your funny preferences, but whatever, okay. It's your money, you get to spend it on whatever horrible stuff you like. Anyway, hot coffee. You start off at 100 degrees, boiling, okay? Very rapidly, it loses its temperature. Otherwise, you would burn your mouth, right? It loses its temperature and it cools rather rapidly. Similarly, and it actually comes down to this. It re what, what, what it actually does is it relaxes. The temperature of the coffee cup relaxes to the overall equilibrium, which is the room temperature of about 18 degrees Celsius, okay? It relaxes. The molecules in, in, in the coffee calm down. Similarly here, similarly here, here's the iced coffee. It's at zero or just above it, nearly frozen. It relaxes. It's cold, or it's temperature, all the way up. So here you have iced coffee that's warming. Here you have hot coffee that's cooling. Now, you might think, why is this man talking about bathtubs and coffee? Just change the metaphor. If you understand that intuitively, now think about the growth rates of economies. Think about the growth rate of Ireland and think about the growth rate of Norway. Here's what Ireland looked like. We started off in 1970 way below. Our GDP growth rate and our, 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 our average GDP per capita was way lower than the OECD average. Up here, this was, this was Norway and the UK. They were much better off than us. What happened was their GDP relaxed down to the OECD average, and ours jumped forward, okay? And so what this argument is for is an argument for convergence. Would everybody please write that down? Convergence. It argues that there's an overall level of convergence. 
And so when you make this argument in economics, this convergence argument, implicitly you're invoking the coffee cup idea. Okay? That a dynamic equilibrium can be reached over time if you relax to some, equi to some equilibrium point. Okay? So, it's a very, very important point. Are there any questions on this before I move on? It's really important that you understand this. Because I'm going to start talking about stocks and flows and balance sheets and stuff. And if you get the idea, the rest of it's going to be easy. If you don't get the idea, if you're like, why is that guy talking like that? Then, then just text me or send me an email or Twitter or whatever. Okay? What's the lesson? Stocks change over time as a result of the actions of a flow. Oh, would everybody please write that down? It's super important. It's super important. So important right now. Stocks change over time as the result of the actions of a flow. The stock of my bank account just keeps going down. I get paid at the end of every month, and then basically big people with fists come and pummel me in the chest. Direct debits, you know, oh, daddy, we, we need meat every day. You know, all that sort of stuff. Greedy children. And uh, yes, basically at the end of the month you end up with very, very little. And the reason that you end up with very little is because all of these flows from your stock. Now, as I said before, a dynamic equilibrium is where the rate of change of the stock is equal to the rate of change of the flow. That is a dynamic equilibrium, where the rate of change of the stock is equal to the rate of change of the flow. It's very important uh, to understand these two concepts. They're interrelated. And if you get this, if you get these two ideas, that stocks change over time as the result of the actions of the flow, in other words, your wealth or the wealth of the nation, or the, the wealth of the firm is as a result of the actions of the flows, its income over time, and its stock, which is its wealth. Okay? So, it's where the rate of change of the stock is equal to the rate of change of the flow. Here's a really good example. Here's the housing stock. This is new housing units built from 1995 to 2009. And so you can see two things here. The first is that blue line represents, well, hang on, does it represent a stock or a flow? Hands up, who thinks the blue line represents a stock? Does the blue line represent a stock or a flow? Hands up, who thinks stock? <laughs> that was cool. A couple of guys like that. Come on, hands up, seriously, who thinks it's a stock? Who, who thinks it's a flow? Who has no idea? It's totally cool to have no idea. It's really fine. So I asked, do you, is it a stock or is it a flow or don't you know? And some people still had their hands down. Oh, one more time, seriously, I, I, you, you, I'm looking at you. Uh, obviously, I can see if you've got your hands down. Hands up who thinks it's a stock. Okay, about 15% of the class. Hands up who thinks it's a flow. 60% uh, of the class. Hands up who doesn't know. About, yeah, okay, the rest of the class, about 20, 25%. Hands up, who didn't put their hands up? <coughs> oh, <laughs> got you. The blue line is a flow. It's not a stock. It's not a stock. It, this, remember, the, remember, it's where the rate of change, sorry, uh, the stocks change over time as the result of the actions of the flow. At any particular point in time, at any particular point in time, <coughs> you will have a certain number of houses. But this, <coughs> Rent measures new houses built. This measures new houses. So this is the addition to the stock. And what is the definition of an addition to a stock? It's a flow. Okay. So this is a flow. And what you see here, what you see here is that the flow stopped very, very rapidly at the end of 2009. The tap was shut off. Okay. You could, you could describe this as, as, as a reinforcing process that started here and stopped right there. So that's why this is a flow and not a stock. So well done to the 15% of the class who got it right, um, presumably by going stock, flow, me, you know, or, or maybe your understanding is, is deeper uh, than, than that. Interesting little fact, this number here is 90,000 or so. 90,000 houses being built at the end of 2009. Uh, sorry, the end of 2009. What that means is that we were producing as many houses as Brit 
We have 4 million people, they have 60. And we were producing as many houses as them. And nobody went, maybe we should not do this anymore. So it's interesting. So is the macroeconomy a set of loops? Yes. The greater the stock of the physical capital, in other words, machines and factories in the economy, and efficiency of production, the more output can be produced every year. Okay? Thus, productivity matters for growth. Why does productivity matter for growth? Because productivity changes the flow. It changes the rate of the flow. Go back to our example about the pizzas, okay? which I actually used in uh, an article this week and it got me into a little bit of trouble again. Um, open mouth insert foot. Anyway, um, they go back to the pizza thing. Productivity is your man producing more pizzas per hour, okay? More pizzas per hour. So, the more output, oops, the more output that can be produced in each year. Productivity matters for growth. Economic capital also has a reinforcing loop, okay? The investment of output. If you're making money, you can invest more money. And if you can invest more money, you'll make more money. There's a reinvestment loop, okay? So the investment of output governs growth. And there's a balancing loop as well. The balancing loop is called depreciation. This slows down the rate of capital accumulation. It stops things from getting out of whack. At the end of the day, this, this computer here, okay, we're going to have to replace this computer in a couple of years because they'll come out with Windows 12 or something, and this won't run. We'll need to get rid of this and buy a new computer. That's depreciation, okay? Or Apple will come out with a thinner one of these, and I won't need to change it at all, but I'll still change it because I'm kind of a bit addicted. Anyway, the important point is there's depreciation. And it governs decline. So think about this. I, you, you won't get another class in, in probably in economics, in, in, certainly not in Ireland, but probably also in the world where you have this type of presentation of economics as a set of controlling, balancing, competing, reinforcing feedback loops. Okay? So, what we're going to do on Monday, I think, is talk about this red line, this sentence here. The more output that's produced, the more that can be invested to make it new capital. Now, it's 12.45, so I have five more minutes of your time. I want to talk to you about your book reviews, because I had some questions. Um, I had some questions on the book reviews, uh, and I'd just like to clear some stuff up and take some questions from you if you like. Okay? So, first things first, the book review, five to six pages. That doesn't include the title page or the references. Uh, people have asked me, should we write references? The answer is yes. If you, if you take information from anywhere else, you must reference it. If it comes from the depths of your own soul, no problem. You don't have to reference yourself. Don't reference lecture notes or any of that stuff. Don't use Wikipedia. It's written by morons. Don't, don't, don't use Wikipedia. Okay? Um, it'll be pretty obvious. Understand that I will check for plagiarism. Um, people have asked, should, should, I an should I answer it in this series of questions? You know, like, talk about the author. Talk about the book. Talk about uh, its relationship to Ireland. Or should I answer it as an essay? Uh, the answer is, that's up to you. If it were me, I would answer it as an essay. Think about, your, think about your ideal audience. The audience that you have here is yourselves. You're all really smart people, okay? You're smart undergraduates. So write, write the book review to your classmates. What that means is you don't have to define what GDP is, okay? You don't have to define what GDP is. You're not writing for the layman in any way. What you're actually doing is you're trying to inform a reader. Imagine that you're writing a, a journal article or a, or a newspaper article for something like The Economist. Okay? Keep it in that style. Keep it chatty and fun, but avoid colloquialisms. Don't put the word like in as a, as a, as a comma. That happened one year. Okay? That's, that's, uh, that's not, not, not good. So, so you don't have to sound like, well, one is quite impressed with this magnificent offering. You don't have to say that. But don't go, sure, it was Grand Horse. Don't say that either. Somewhere in the middle. Just go out. On the bounce. No, no, no. Okay? You don't need to say stuff like that. Um, in terms of including graphs and stuff like that, you can, absolutely. You need to reference the graph. You need to show me where you got it from. What else was I asked? What else was I asked? Um, what else was I asked? 
I forget. Okay. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them uh, in the two minutes that we have left before we head off on our separate ways. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much and have a nice week. And I'll talk to you on Monday. <laughs>